Louise Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun is France's last great portraitist, the most famous in Europe. A child prodigy, taught by her father, she starts painting professionally at the age of 14. Ambitious and independent, she gains access to the highest levels of power by becoming portraitist to Queen Marie Antoinette. Energetic and determined, she'll produce over 660 portraits. Because of her close ties to the royal court, she's forced to flee into exile during the French Revolution. This period of exile, which she imagined would last only six months, will last 13 years, taking her to all the royal courts of Europe. She'll live in Italy, Austria, England, and Russia. A friend of the rich and powerful and the greatest artists of her time, she'll be acclaimed in all the royal courts and art academies of Europe. Her destiny is that of a talented and free woman who managed to combine success and fortune. She'll declare in her memoirs, before the revolution, women ruled. The revolution dethroned them. My very dear friend, you urge me so warmly to write my memoirs for you that I have decided to satisfy your desire. Imagine what it will mean to my heart to recall the various events I have witnessed. And the friends who exist no more, save in my thought. Nevertheless, the task will be an easy one, for my heart loves to remember. And in my hours of loneliness, those dear departed friends surround me still. So vivid do they appear to my imagination. Louise Elizabeth Vigée was born in Paris in April 1755, a few months before Marie Antoinette. 18th century France saw the growth of a practice of major significance, wet nursing. Middle-class women, the wives of artisans and merchants, send their children to neighboring villages in order to be free to carry out their activities. Shortly after her birth, little Elisabeth will be entrusted to a wet nurse in the Epernon region of Normandy. In 1761, her father Louis comes to take her home. Elizabeth, now aged six, discovers a father she doesn't know and has to say goodbye to her foster family. She'll spend a few weeks in the family apartment in Paris, Rue de Clery, where she'll discover the day-to-day -day life of her parents, her brother Etienne, three years younger than herself, and especially her father's work. Her father was a pastel portraitist, a member of the Academy of St. Luc Artists Guild. He was a man who sought out the company of musicians, poets, and wits. Court life and the growth of a wealthy Parisian middle class account for the increasing popularity of the portrait. Latour, Van Loo, Greuze, or Drouet will be the fashionable masters of this art. Everyone wanted their portrait painted. There was no other way to preserve your likeness in that age. Pastel's artist Louis Viget, whilst not having the genius of the great masters, has acquired a fairly large clientele. Artists, nobles, and burghers all sit for him. I mentioned these facts to show what an inborn passion for the art I possessed. My father, whose name was Viget, made very good pastel drawings. He did some portraits which would have been worthy of the famous Latour. But coming back to the pleasures I enjoyed in my childhood home, I must tell you that my father allowed me to paint several heads in pastels and also to dabble with his crayons all day. Her father adored her, and he would give her free reign when he would let her in his studio take his pastel boxes and start drawing. Her father's very encouraging of her talent, and one day, after seeing a drawing she did of a bearded man, exclaims, you will be a painter, child, if there ever was one. 
After a few short weeks spent in the family home, Elisabeth is sent to boarding school at the Trinity Convent in the Faubourg Saint Antoine. At six years old, she's one of its youngest pupils. While boys are educated in schools or through private tutors, girls from the upper and middle classes are mainly educated in convents. They're taught very little, biblical history, the basics of sewing and writing, in order to prepare them for their future roles as companionable wives and mothers. At the age of 11, she leaves the convent. Her father undertakes to train her and sends her to one of his friends, a painter called Deven, who teaches her how to set a palette. These future artists in painting, pastels or drawing, are going to meet other masters during their youth. Madame Vigie Lebrun will have a lot of admiration for artists such as Jean-Baptiste Greuze and Joseph Verne. She'll observe them, question them, and listen to their advice on how to improve. Elisabeth continues her apprenticeship, but is soon going to lose her first teacher. I had just spent one happy year in my parents' house when my father fell ill. My mother wept day and night. As for myself, I will not attempt to describe my desolation. I was about to lose the best of fathers, my support, my guide, the one whose indulgence encouraged my first attempts. In order to distract her from her grief, her mother, Jeanne, takes her to see the private collections of masterpieces exhibited to the public, such as that of the Duke of Orléans, where Elizabeth gets to know the great European painters and develops her taste. She had no real formal training. She took courses here and there, dabbled in, in the, but you can't say she's self-taught, actually. At the age of 12, in order to help her mother and pay for her young brother's schooling, Elizabeth is obliged to work. Her talent soon becomes noticed, in particular through two portraits, which reveal her precocious artistic maturity. The portrait of her brother Etienne dressed as a schoolboy, which she's believed to have painted at the age of 14, and that of her mother are so well done that they're talked about in Paris. Commissions soon begin to flow in. A year after the death of her husband, Jeanne Messin marries a rich jeweler, Jacques-François Le Sèvre, to whom Elisabeth and Étienne are openly hostile. When the young girl starts to receive payment for her first commission portraits, Le Sèvre considers that this money belongs to him and he uses it for himself. Elizabeth rapidly builds up a large clientele of artists, burghers, and nobles. Her fees increase, and she starts earning a lot of money. For the gentleman models who gaze at her too insistently, she devises a clever trick to turn their eyes away from her. As for those gentlemen, as soon as I realized they wished to make eyes at me, I would paint them with their gaze averted, which prevents the sitter from looking at the painter. At the least movement of their pupils in my direction, I would say, I am doing the eyes now. This would vex them a little, as you can imagine, and my mother, who was always present and whom I had taken into my confidence, would laugh to herself. In fact, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun practically invents this masculine theme, that of the pre-romantic character gazing off into the distance eyes raised up to heaven, his thoughts elsewhere. In this way, she diverts the man's eyes and possible amorous intentions away from her. So she shows intelligence there too, wiliness, I'd say, in the way she deals with this situation. Despite her numerous commissions, Elizabeth finds time to enjoy the favorite pastime of 18th century Parisians, going out for a stroll. Nobles and gentry, artisans, merchants, and scamps pass each other by in the Tuileries gardens, in the squares of the Champs Elysees, in the Luxembourg and Palais Royal gardens, where Elizabeth and her family live. When out strolling, you have to see, and especially be seen. 
Fashionable gathering places are created and last for a brief time, such as the Colosseum. Located in one of the Champs-Élysées squares, this amusement site, illuminated by 2,000 candles, could hold 40,000 people. Its attractions included cafes, circuses, trinket and curiosity shops, a show hall, a ball, and a fireworks display. During these strolls, Elizabeth attracts a lot of attention. It's at this time that two women, important for her future destiny, will cross her path. The Duchess of Chartres, who you might say is her neighbor, since she resides in the Palais Royal Gardens, will ask her to come and paint her portrait, as well as that of her friends. The Duchess of Chartres, future Duchess of Orléans, is a patron of the arts. It's she who will introduce the milliner and dressmaker Rose Bertin to Queen Marie Antoinette. The second meeting that will prove decisive for Elizabeth's future success will again take place during one of her strolls in a park. We went to marly le roi and there I realized for the first time how enchanting a place could be. One morning, I met the queen walking in the park with several ladies of her court. They were all in white dresses and so young that they looked like an apparition. I was with my mother and was turning away to leave when the queen very kindly stopped me and invited me to continue in any direction I might prefer. <laughs> Marie Antoinette had arrived in France in May 1770 at the age of 15 to marry Louis Auguste, Dauphin of France and grandson of Louis XV. During a firework display held to celebrate the marriage, Place Louis XV, future Place de la Concorde, is the scene of a dramatic incident. 133 people are smothered and trampled to death during a wave of panic caused by a fire set off by a falling rocket. An ominous omen, for it's on this very same site that 20 years later, the royal couple will be executed. Elizabeth and her family escape the fire unharmed. Elizabeth's clientele grows larger day by day, but she works as a free agent outside any official institution. The Gironde, a body governing professional incorporations, seizes her studio and obliges her to register her activity within a professional framework. In 18th century France, it's obligatory to belong to an artist's guild. And in Paris, this was the Academy of St. Luke. So if you weren't a member of the Academy of St. Luke, you had to be a member of the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. This is why she applies to become a member of the Academy of St. Luke, where she'll be enthusiastically accepted. In 1775, Jacques-François Le Sèvre and his family moved to an apartment in a big mansion house in Rue de Clery, almost directly opposite the former apartment of Louis Viget. Their apartment is in a beautiful mansion house called the Loubert Mansion, whose live-in owner is Jean-Baptiste Pierre Lebrun. Jean-Baptiste is an ambitious young man who pursues a triple career as painter, art restorer, and art dealer. His apartments are filled with works of the old masters, which Elizabeth will study and copy. The best learning method for aspiring female painters who'd already mastered the basics was to copy the existing works of art. It's always been like that. Jean-Baptiste is also the curator of several large private art collections, such as that of the Count of Vaudreuil. Joseph Hyacinthe de Vaudreuil is a nobleman at the court of Louis XVI. Peer of France, governor of the Louvre, and member of the Academy of Fine Arts, he'll become one of the first collectors of Elizabeth's portraits. At the Lubert mansion, the young art dealer soon succumbs to the charms of the talented and beautiful young woman. I was then 20 years old. I was living without anxiety as to my future, since I was earning a good deal of money, and thus felt no inclination for matrimony. But my mother, who believed Monsieur Lebrun to be very rich, unceasingly urged me not to review such a profitable match, and I at last consented to the marriage. 
They both have an artistic sensitivity. They can discuss painting, and they're both very ambitious. So it's this love of painting, this ambition, and a mutual attraction that will form the bond of their couple, which will last, finally, for quite a number of years. Jean-Baptiste does business with the Dutch art dealers, and he takes the young woman with him on one of his trips to Flanders. In Antwerp, she discovers the masterpieces of Rubens. It's during this trip that the great master's technique inspires her to do a self-portrait on oak panel. The use of oil on wood gives the painting a glossy, almost enamel effect, which is different to the effect produced by oil on canvas. The panels are remarkable for the transparency of the coloration which is surely a Rubensian effect, because it's very clear that she was very, very much influenced by Rubens. She visits the Antwerp art dealer, Jean-Michel Van Ave, and discovers a portrait that's commonly known as the straw hat. It's actually a felt hat, which enables an effect of projected shadow, a play of light and shade, particularly on the face and forehead. She went back to France and painted her self-portrait, which was, is one of the greatest pictures she ever painted, and the first one on panel. And she learned the she uh, acquired skill in painting with glazes, with colored glazes, and she's at the top of her form there. The painting is so successful that Elizabeth, at the request of her clients, re-employs the same accessories, the silk shawl edged in black lace, and the hat, creating a gentle chiaroscuro effect, can be found in several of her other portraits. She'll use them to cover Madame du Barry, herself, Marie Antoinette, and many others. It's amusing to see that from one portrait to another, Vigée Lebrun, once she's found a formula that works, will use this same costume, these same accessories, on different models. Although united through their shared love for painting and their ambition, Elisabeth and Jean-Baptiste live independent lives, and she'll describe her husband as a dissipated gambler who squanders all her money. She speaks very badly of her husband in her memoirs, but I think her husband was very useful to her, in fact, not only by introducing her to great works of art, but also by his unfailing support of her. Elisabeth nonetheless follows Jean-Baptiste's advice and sets up a painting atelier for young ladies. The young woman doesn't have much authority over her students, but transmits to them her love of art and her technique. Her young ladies' school, as Madame Lebrun calls it, will prove to be quite a success. She had a group of young women around her who worked at her side and whom she taught. And one of the exercises she had them do was the expressive head study. Not able to have live models in her atelier, Elisabeth gives her students her own drawings to copy as an exercise. These are drawings done in black chalk with white chalk highlights. And we can see that she works as though she's using pastels, that is, she stomps her lines, probably with her fingertips. She smudges the black chalk to model the face, to create this shading that brings out the depth and volume. This is a very difficult exercise that each of her students has to learn how to do. Shortly after opening her school, Elisabeth gives birth to her first child, a little girl that she'll name Julie, soon nicknamed Brunette. Added to the joy of being a mother is the satisfaction of becoming a recognized artist, whose fees are amongst the highest of her time. Jean-Baptiste Pierre Lebrun, who knows the art market very well and who's an excellent businessman, 
knew what he was doing when he set extremely high prices for his wife's paintings. An art dealer specializes in handling their artist in order to achieve the best result financially. But I have the impression that Vigée Le Brun was able to achieve the result financially on her own. She's personable and talented enough to be able to establish her own connections. Little by little, she's going to succeed in making a name for herself in the society of her time, on the one hand through her talent, and on the other through her beauty. She's a very graceful woman, very bright and cultivated. While heads may turn to look at her in Paris, it's Elizabeth's conversation that particularly charms her models during sittings. Another thing about painting portraits is that you have to be an intelligent person and a good conversationalist. People hated sitting for portraits. Members of the royal family hated it the most because they had to be painted the most. They wanted to be entertained when they sat. Ambitious, her desire is to reach the highest ranks of power, and it's undoubtedly through the Duchess of Chartres that she gains access to Queen Marie Antoinette. In 1778, she obtains official entrance to the royal palace of Versailles. Empress Maria Theresa, who was my Antoinette's mother, was an admission that she received. Um, she received some portraits that were that were that so offended her that she uh, asked the queen to find a painter. Marie Antoinette est toujours déçue. Marie Antoinette is always disappointed with the portraits done of her. There's this famous letter to her mother in November 1774 in which she writes, the painters kill me and make me despair. So it's in this context of expectancy on the part of the queen that Louise Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun is going to be given her chance at painting her. And it's this first portrait of the queen called En robe à panier, in a hoop skirt. When you look at the Queen's face in this portrait, it's still the Habsburg face, that is, the jutted out chin, the thick bottom lip, the slightly protruding eyes. Then, progressively, she uses her talent to soften these physical defects, to create an image which, ten years later, is that of this woman of great beauty, but which no longer exactly reflects reality. The likenesses are, are perfect, and yet she operated like a, like a plastic surgeon. Elizabeth's true talent could be said to be that of adapting herself to the personality of her sitter. She's capable of bringing out the grace of the young noble ladies. The piquant lightness of the actress Madame Mollet Raymond. Or the sensuality of Madame Grant, the future Princess of Talleyrand. There's a lot of grace in Vigée Le Brun's portraits, and her texture is soft and velvety, in fact. There's a lot of sentiment there, rather than sentimentality. We feel she has empathy for her model. Because she listens and observes, she knows how to bring out the natural attributes of her models. It is difficult, however, to convey to anyone who has not seen the Queen an adequate idea of her noble traits and many graceful qualities. But the most remarkable thing about her face was the splendor of her complexion. I have never seen one so brilliant. And brilliant is the word, for her skin was so transparent that it had no shading. I was unable to reproduce its effect to my satisfaction. I had no colors to paint such freshness, such delicate tints, which were hers alone, and which I have never found in any other woman. Marie Antoinette has found her portraitist, while not actually being close friends, a steady relationship of affectionate intimacy established itself between the two women. 
Marie Antoinette shares her passion for the opera with the portraitist, and the sittings often end with the two of them performing in a duet the fashionable tunes of the time. Elizabeth now wants the ultimate recognition, that of being accepted by the Royal Academy of Painting. But she's refused admission, because its regulations formally forbid any contact with mercantile professions, and she's the wife of an art dealer. A woman at that time shared the profession of her husband. So that was the reason they excluded her. And so she went behind their backs and went to the queen and persuaded the queen to get permission from the king for her to be able to enter the academy because that was the royal way to succeed. Then you could exhibit in the official salon of the academy. In reality, the academy accepts very few women artists. Only four of them will be admitted in 1783, Madame Lebrun, Anne Valayer Coster, Marie-Thérèse Reboul, and a formidable rival in the art of portraiture, Adelaide Labie Guillard. She and her great rival, uh, Madame Labie Guillard, uh, used to show their finest works in the Salon, and each of them tried to beat the other one. So in, in 1783, Vigée Lebrun did her self-portrait uh, wearing a straw hat, which is one of the great masterpieces of her. The very next Salon, uh, Madame Labie Guillard produced her self-portrait with her students. So she was trying to, to, to show off and to put herself on the same level as her rival. Madame Vigée Lebrun, who was extremely ambitious, ardently wanted to attain the higher hierarchy of painting, which was history painting. Among the history painters, Jacques-Louis David, member of the Royal Academy, is the uncontested master. He will achieve fame in 1784 with his famous painting, Oath of the Horatii, which will eclipse his rivals. He'll be a precious friend and advisor to Elizabeth. She always wanted to be a history painter. In the scale of, uh, of the genres, history painting was at the very top, and portraiture came a much, in a much lower... Uh, had a much lower standing. In the 18th century, anatomy is a domain strictly reserved for men. The rule for women is not to see a nude body, not to be in the presence of a nude body. If you couldn't draw from a male nude, you couldn't paint history, you couldn't paint mythology. Essentially, you couldn't rise to the highest plane in the arts, so you were permanently handicapped. Madame Vigée Lebrun gets through thanks to the helping hand of her royal connections and impudently flirts with the history painting genre through the work she presents as her reception piece, Peace Bringing Back Prosperity. We can see in this her desire to be a history painter, but using female models, so remaining within the limits of decency. But while women may know a certain success as artists, they're limited to the minor arts, which are the miniature, the portrait, or still life. What's always interesting with these still lives is that these women are sending a hidden message. Anne Valayer Coster is an artist specialized in this static world that is still life, one of the compositions of which hides a very distinctive signature. This marine still life, showing shells opening before us, is a female signature with very precise symbols, almost depictions of female genitalia.
The protection afforded to the portraitist through her royal connections has unexpected consequences. Rumors start circulating. She's accused of contributing to the royal deficit by burning banknotes to warm herself, of having multiple lovers, including Monsieur de Calonne, the then controller general of finances. A fictitious erotic correspondence between Elizabeth and Calonne is published and distributed in Paris. Her closeness to a more and more unpopular queen soon harms her reputation of a horrible uh, press campaign against her uh, because she was, she belonged to the circle that who formed the most intimate uh, friendships with, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the court of uh, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette and she became the official or rather the non-official first painter to the queen. Elizabeth is likened to the much criticized queen who's accused of being clannish, of spending extravagantly, and of disregarding court etiquette. Marie Antoinette, uh, Marie Antoinette breaches court etiquette by choosing her own dressmakers, which theoretically she doesn't have the right to do. But she overrides this rule. And this is why she favors Rose Bertin, as well as other dressmakers, and why she also favors Elizabeth Vigée-Lebrun. She's really the protector of both these women. This female trio, represented by Marie Antoinette, Rose Bertin, and the portraitist, will become the model for Parisian taste. Elizabeth, for her part, spends very little on her wardrobe and invents a simple and practical dress style that's suited to her work. Leaving aside wigs, hoops, and adornments, she wears white cotton blouses and comfortable skirts that she embellishes with a colored belt. Soon, ladies of the court and Parisian women will want to emulate her style of dress. She explains that she wants to change the fashion codes and move more towards simplicity. She relates that she's the first one not to use powder on her models, to have natural-looking hair on her portraits. All this takes place in a historical context, the 1780s, influenced by Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his natural man philosophy. Madame Lebrun, always on the lookout for new clients, knows that the Salon of the Royal Academy, a veritable contemporary art fair, is the place to be seen at. She exhibits her portraits there at each session. The art salon is indispensable. You have to show yourself. And this is something that Vigée Lebrun excels at, because not only is she a woman artist, she's also a businesswoman, a strategist, who pursues her career in a very independent way, and who understood marketing ahead of her time. Elizabeth and Marie Antoinette mutually enhance each other. The artist simplifies the look of her royal model and beautifies it. But this simplification has its limits, and for the Salon of 1783, she'll propose a quite unexpected picture of the Queen. We know the story of the famous muslin dress portrait in which Marie Antoinette wears a simple English-style dress, where the Queen progressively agrees to discard her heavy, stiff gowns and be represented in a much simpler manner. This muslin dress, which is a simple cotton muslin dress, places the spotlight on a material, cotton, that's normally used for underwear or for a house dress at the most. So it's particularly audacious on the part of Vigée Lebrun to present a portrait of Marie Antoinette dressed in a muslin dress in 1783, because this is the first salon where she's exhibiting and she's taking an enormous risk. A risk she doesn't entirely assume, however, because a few days later, because of the scandal it provoked, she withdraws the painting and replaces it with an identical portrait, but with the queen wearing a much more conventional dress. Despite the scandal provoked by the portrait, Marie Antoinette's faith in her portraitist remains unshaken. She'll commission other portraits from her, and soon one of her children, too.
We have to place ourselves in the context. A few years after their marriage, the royal couple's infertility becomes an affair of state, so much that the arrival of Madame Royale, married Theresa Charlotte, is a cause for national celebration. And then the birth of the Dauphin, Louis-Joseph Xavier Francois, sends the country into raptures of joy, since there's now a male heir to the throne, ensuring dynastic continuity. Madame Lebrun is going to place them in a pastoral setting, with the royal children sitting on the ground. This is not at all in keeping with court etiquette, and yet their costume still reminds us of the rank of Marie Antoinette's children, since the heir apparent wears the insignia and the celestial blue ribbon of the Order of the Holy Spirit, which all children of the Sovereign receive on the day of their baptism. Madame Vigée Lebrun will find the model for this painting in a work by one of her elders, François Hubert Drouet, called Comte d'Artois and Madame Clotilde. They are the brother and sister of Louis XVI. Pregnant again, Elisabeth loses her second child, aged only a few months. She transfers all her affection to Julie. In the tradition of the Virgins of Raphael, whom she admires, she paints herself with her arms around her daughter, an expression of maternal tenderness on her face. In 1787, she paints herself with her daughter in a self-portrait that the critics are immediately going to name maternal tenderness, this gentle affection of the soul. And this portrait will be unanimously applauded at the Salon. It's true, it does give off a particularly harmonious image of the mother-child relationship. And it's this sort of ideal, symbiotic image that the artist will try to preserve, and which will be destroyed by the reality of her true relationship with her daughter. King Louis XVI, and especially Marie Antoinette, are the target of increasingly aggressive criticisms and satirical cartoons. Discontent is brewing, and what should have remained just an anecdote in 1785 becomes a scandal. The jewelers Beaumer and Bassange had in their safe since 1772 a fabulous 2,800 carat diamond necklace intended for Madame du Barry. Louis XV dies before the necklace is delivered. The jewelers offer it on two separate occasions to Marie Antoinette, who refuses it. The Countess de la Motte concocts an extraordinary plan to steal the necklace, compromising the queen. When the affair comes to light, the Countess is arrested and branded with V for voleur, meaning thief. The necklace was never found. The pamphleteers picked up the story of the affair of the necklace and refused to believe in Marie Antoinette's innocence. The scandal destroys what's left of the queen's reputation in the eyes of the public, who now accuse her of all kinds of wrongs. This is why the superintendent of the king's buildings, Donchevilliers, is going to commission from the artist a portrait of the queen as a mother with her children. It's at a time when the queen is extremely unpopular. She's referred to as the Austrian. There's this famous necklace affair. So it's really in the aim of rehabilitating Marie Antoinette, to have people forget the frivolous young woman she may have been and rehabilitate her through exalting her in her role as mother. So it's a highly political commission. It's a group portrait, a composition that the artist isn't particularly used to doing, and it's also a very large format portrait, so she's going to ask David for advice. He suggests a triangular composition in order to sanctify the painting and bring to mind the compositions of the Renaissance, and in particular, Raphael's holy families. Exhibited in the Salon of 1787 between the portrait of Julie and her mother and a portrait of Madame Adelaide by La Biguillard, the painting could almost allude to an episode of Roman history, that of Cornelia, mother of the Gracchi. A friend who'd come to visit Cornelia and show off her jewelry asked to see Cornelia's in turn. Cornelia replies by gesturing to her children, these are my treasures and my finest jewels. That's why we see in this highly composed painting Queen Marie Antoinette with her children and behind them the Queen's jewel case. The jewel case is relegated to the background and it's her children that are placed in the foreground. 
Placed on the jewel case is the royal crown resting on a cushion decorated with fleur-de-lis to remind us of the majestic dignity of the characters. We're still in a royal context. Now this jewel case, even if it is in the shadows, can't help bringing to mind the recent affair of the necklace, so it's perhaps because of this that the painting fails in its purpose. Everyone sees the portrait. It's heavily criticized, especially for the expression on the queen's face, which is deemed to be too sad. It's far too late for Marie Antoinette's reputation to be restored. These scandals don't make a dent in Madame Lebrun's artistic and social successes. Her little antechamber has become a very popular salon in Paris, where celebrities can be counted amongst the painters, poets, and fashionable musicians. Salons were the private entertainment of that time, especially in the class of society in which she operated. And in order to have access to the right people, it would be necessary to them, meet them under the right circumstances. And those circumstances would be the salon, where every sort of conversation was held, where you needed knowledge of music and the arts, where you needed to know everything that was going on in society, and where you had to amuse everybody. Otherwise, they wouldn't come to your salon. Anyone who was anyone in Paris, in music, came to her salon. So who were these people? Well, there was Gluck. Gluck is a star in France. Since his arrival at the Paris Opera House, he received lots of commissions. He wrote six great operas for Paris. Gretry came to her salon, she sang with him, and Gretry was also a European celebrity. Everyone came to her. She put on very, very fine entertainments at home. In a constant spirit of creativity, Elizabeth lends support to a movement that will be very popular up until the beginning of the 19th century, the return to the antique style. I will now give you, my dear friend, the exact account of the most brilliant supper I ever gave in the days when people were always talking about my luxurious and magnificent way of life. While she rests, her brother would read her poems or books, and that day he reads her an excerpt from a novel by the Abbot Barthélemy describing an antique-style dinner. One evening, when I had invited a dozen or more friends to hear a recital by the poet Lebrun, my brother read aloud to me a few pages of the travels of Anarchists during my rest. When he came to the passage where, in the description of a Greek dinner, the method of preparing various sauces is explained, he said, we ought to try this tonight. I sent immediately for my cook and gave her the necessary instructions for the preparation of a certain sauce for the fowl and of another for the eel. My atelier, full of things I used for draping my models, would furnish me with enough material for garments. I placed behind the chairs a large screen, which I took the precaution of concealing beneath some hangings looped up at intervals, as may be seen in Poussin's pictures. As I was expecting some very beautiful women, I thought it a good idea to dress everybody in Greek costumes in order to have a surprise ready for Monsieur de Vaudreuil, who was not expected till 10 o'clock. As I always wore white gowns in the form of a tunic, I needed only to put a chaplet of flowers on my head. The preparations were finished. I took particular pains in costuming my daughter, darling child that she was. The guests start to arrive. Madame de Bonneuil, Madame Chalgrin. She dresses them up in drapings from her studio, wraps scarves and shawls around their waists. And there they were, all three metamorphosed into perfect Athenians. Lebrun Pandar comes in, and I fix on his head a crown of laurels. At 10 o'clock, we heard the carriage of Count de Vaudreuil enter the courtyard. He was so surprised and delighted that he stood motionless for a long time before making up his mind to take the seat we had reserved for him. I do not believe I have ever spent a more amusing evening. Monsieur de Vaudreuil was so delighted with the evening that he talked about it to all his acquaintances the next day. 
Some ladies of the court begged me to repeat the performance. I declined for various reasons, whereat several of the ladies took offense. If the name of Count Vaudreuil is so often mentioned in Madame Lebrun's memoirs, it's because their relationship may have been less platonic than she describes it. She probably had a liaison with Count Vaudreuil. In any case, her gardener notes in his diary that Madame Lebrun was Vaudreuil's mistress. Madame Lebrun possessed among her objects a snuff box which had a lock of Vaudreuil's hair inlaid in its lid. There exists a regular correspondence between them. This correspondence was burnt during the Reign of Terror by Étienne Viget for safety's sake. But the fact that this correspondence existed gives us a clue. Since the end of the 1780s, bad harvests and ever heavier taxes weaken and discontent the population. Revolts break out. To find a solution to the financial crisis, the king convokes a meeting of the Estates General. On June the 20th, 1789, in the Jeux de Paume room at Versailles, the deputies of the Third Estate, the clergy and the nobility take an oath not to adjourn before adopting a constitution for France. On June the 30th, the people of Paris storm the prison of the Abbey of Saint-Germain-des-Prés and free the French guards imprisoned there for insubordination. On the morning of July the 14th, the Parisian rioters go looking for arms. They pillage the arsenal of the Hotel des Invalides and the Royal Treasury, where they find guns and cannons, but no powder. They'll find some at the Bastille, together with other partisans of the revolution, amassed in front of the fortress prison in Faubourg Saint-Antoine since that morning. The storming and destruction of the Bastille, symbol of arbitrary power, begins. An atmosphere of insecurity spreads through Paris, and Louise Elizabeth feels herself in danger. Inscriptions are scrawled on the newly renovated walls of the Lebrun mansion. She can no longer show herself at the window. A new municipal administration is going to be set up. Louis XVI goes to Paris on July the 17th and agrees to wear pinned to his hat the tricolor cockade, a combination of blue and red, the colors of Paris, with the royal white. During the night of August the 4th, 1789, the assembly abolishes aristocratic privilege. The society of the old order is living its final moments. Louise Elizabeth, who doesn't want to stay at the Lebrun house, goes to Louveciennes, where she's promised Madame du Barry, the former favorite of Louis XV, to paint her portrait. She finds a moment of peace in this setting, where she admires the view of the Seine hillsides. At Louveciennes, time seems to have stood still. But the peace is deceptive. Paris is under siege, and violent rioting rages day and night in the suburbs. From Louveciennes, we could hear cannon fire in the distance. And I remember the poor woman saying, if Louis XV were alive, none of this would be happening. Elizabeth knows that she has to leave France. It's effectively the moment for her to go into exile. She waited, however, until October before leaving, unlike Count Artois, who left on July the 14th. On October the 5th, 1789, a crowd, mainly women, makes its way towards Versailles. The king receives a delegation. But at break of day on October the 6th, the horde storms the palace, killing several guards. To calm the situation, Louis agrees to go with his family to the Tuileries Palace. They're escorted through an angry, vociferous crowd. The heads of guards are brandished on pikes. For Elizabeth, flight is now inevitable. By a strange coincidence, she'll take the stagecoach the day after the royal family is led from Versailles to the town hall, then to the Tuileries. That night, disguised as working women, Elisabeth, Brunette, and her governess climb into the stagecoach.
Her brother Etienne, Jean-Baptiste Lebrun, and their friend Hubert Robert ride at the side of the coach up to the Saint Antoine barrier. The first stage of the journey will take Elisabeth to Lyon. She doesn't know it yet, but this journey will last 13 years. 13 years of exile throughout Europe. <laughs> 